I want to uh, begin, Jeff, Jeff Bartos, uh, of course, the uh, 2018 Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor, uh, also a, an entrepreneur, a real estate developer, and uh, uh, a very civically <clears throat> engaged member of the private sector. Uh, you will remember Jeff from our Jeff Brown discussion. Uh, Jeff was uh, really the founder of the 30-Day Fund, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about, which is uh, giving lifelines to small business entrepreneurs who, uh, for many reasons that were um, unfortunate, are not in line for PPP loans. Uh, and our Lieutenant Governor, uh, John Fetterman, who of course uh, is, uh, has, has made headlines across the state, uh, Lieutenant Governor elected in 2018, former mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, which is where he joins us uh, tonight. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming to this. Thank you for having us. Uh, let's begin, I wanna begin with uh, the, the details of your relationship, the relationship that you two uh, have developed. And take me back, you both win the nomination. And, the, the, and, and John, you were um, at, at some political event and yeah. your well, no, seemed to be we opponent were, walked up to you yeah. and, and you thought he was trying to mess with your head. Yeah. We were in, uh, we were in I remember it very clearly, we were in Harrisburg and we were, uh, it was doing like candidates meet the, the, the various unions uh, and they were in the ballroom and, and, and uh, I ran into Jeff in the hallway and he was, came up to me and he was so nice and he's like, hey, we should, we should change numbers and, uh, and, and whatever. And he was so nice and down to earth. I, uh, I said to my, my guy afterwards, I'm like, is he, is he effing with me? I mean, like, he, uh, like this can't be real. And, uh, um, and then that was, that was the first time I actually met Jeff uh, in, in person. And uh, it shows you the sad state of affairs is that like somebody who is kind and genuine and just straight up sincere, uh, you, to be automatically suspicious of, uh, I think it shows that. Yeah, and uh, so you exchanged phone numbers and then yeah. you guys started like, and, and, and for, for everyone in the audience, this is really rare in the world of politics that opponents, that staffers would let opponents have a relationship where they text each other during the campaign. Jeff, is that, would you just like get random tech, to send random texts back to each other? I think um, so. When I approached John that night, uh, of course, I had followed his career from mayor of Braddock and running for the Senate in 2016, and, and a, like an outstanding campaign he ran in 16. And and he's just a very interesting person. You know, he and Giselle and their kids and the, everything they built uh, around the community there in Braddock. And so I was just excited to meet him. And I thought I said to him that night. You know, at some point, something's going to happen on this campaign where we're going to want to speak directly and we should exchange numbers. And, you know, and then, as I recall, and John, John's memory will be better than mine. Uh, but I, as I recall, you know, we started to text and then every once in a while we call. And, and what we both realized pretty quickly was that the people in our own parties can be a lot meaner uh, than the people in the opposition party when it comes to sort of, I'll call it petty stuff. And, uh, I think I can't speak for Giselle, but I can certainly tell you Cheryl had no interest in hearing about the troubles I was having in a particular day in Adams County. And so at some point that uh, summer, we just started uh, talking about what are you doing today? Where are you? What's going on? And then it also became a chance to, to very, uh, I think, almost like YPO, like confidential. Like we were, we were able to exchange information and talk to each other about what was going on in a way that we knew we respect each other's privacy. Yeah. Didn't Cheryl at one point say to you, this might have been after the families met for dinner, and say to you, like, why didn't we meet people like this in politics up till now? <laughs> she did say that after John and Dizel came over to, uh, after, after John was elected, he was the lieutenant governor elect. Yeah, it was after the election. It was three nights after the election or something. And, and I said to, to Jill, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, 
we never got a chance to, to, to visit after the Tree of Life tragedy. And I said to Giselle, I'm like, I, 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 I drove, we drove all the way to your home uh, just, just that because um, I'm like, like I was, I, I would not let that go. I'm like, I, I, I it's like, I really want to, I really want to sit down. And, and uh, we drove uh, and they in, invited us into their home and, and we had wine and cheese and, and just talked. And it was, it was uh, amazing. And, uh, and our, yeah. oh, sorry, our, our puppy had never met anyone as tall as John. So she was, she, she, she was sort of, she was it's the only time I've ever heard her bark. Uh, she was just <laughs> stunned. But, you know, Larry, I think we discussed this. Um, the debate doesn't happen in October if John and I hadn't struck up a relationship over that summer. And uh, I think we both, you know, there was definitely an argument to not have the debate. And I, I can't speak for John. I, I was thrilled to be able to share a stage with him and to talk about ideas. And I'm sure we'll talk about that that uh, Saturday in October when uh, the Tree of Life massacre happened. But that that debate for me was probably, I, again, I can't speak for John, but for me it was definitely one of the highlights of the campaign to be able to share a stage with uh, such a, you know, such a great leader and, and, a, and a thought leader on policy issues. Jeff is too generous, but but the, the thing about the debate with me really resonated was is that we, we agreed first and foremost that it, we weren't going to go negative. We weren't going to be like nasty with each other. And it was just going to be like, you know, here's what Jeff believes. Here's what I believe. And I, I think you're going to find that there's, there's overlap. And we were going to have an honest conversation on issues. And isn't that what most people want? You know, they, they didn't want the, the bickering and the back and forths and all this other stuff. And that's exactly what we had. And like, I, like I, I remember seeing him in the studio. It was actually out west here, uh, yep. PXI, if I believe. Um, and I, I remember greeting him warmly, you know, walking by. And he's huddled in with his people, and I have my people. And, and I was like, my dude, what's going on? And, uh, and I still don't think staffers ever really fully, you know, you know were understood what was what, what, what the relationship was but uh but yeah it it, it was uh it, it never deviated from that initial first like you know i was like i know like this is a good dude and and it wasn't ever gonna deviate for me on that well you know i i, I uh watched that debate uh and i hadn't been i know jeff fairly well but i hadn't been in touch with him uh during the campaign figured he's he's off doing his thing so I knew nothing about this uh, relationship that you guys had. But what struck me is not just that it was issue oriented and, and civil, uh, which I would expect with you two, but there was also, and this is the thing that really bothers me about our politics, there was no questioning of the other person's motives. Yeah. You took the argument of the other person at face value and then rebutted it. And, and that, I don't know why, but that doesn't happen anymore, especially in debates. Yeah, all right. And, and also the human side. Jeff mentioned that his mother passed recently, and that hit me. I mean, we're, we're both men of a same, a similar age, and, and I'm like, like I, I'm like, I could not not express my sincere, you know, because it's like, I mean, I'm lucky I have both of my parents, but inevitable, that's, it's an inevitability, and, and it was just like, like, I'm not here to rip someone's head off it's like I, I just wanted to say man i'm so sorry dude that's that's that is just the, one of the worst things anyone can face in life so yeah it was really nice it was in the middle of the debate and, and larry i i john I, john may have done these before it was they say ready set go and it's 30 minutes straight there's no commercial breaks there's no oh you messed that up you gotta we can re-record that it was just go and i remember him saying he he he, I paused and he said, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. And I, it was all I could do to not break down. I mean, I was just like, I was struck by the humanity of it. I was also struck by how decent that was. And, and again, we'll talk about the day of the tree of life massacre, but that, that was a foreshadowing of how John really approached, uh, you know, our, the way we interacted on the campaign trail. Well, yeah. Speaking of you breaking down, which I, I happen to know you do a lot, uh, Jeff, um, uh, on that Saturday, you were, I believe you were taking your daughter to college. We were at Franklin and Marshall. It was Emily's freshman year. And Cheryl and I were at a parents weekend thing with, uh, with Emily and her team. And, uh, it was shortly after 10 AM and 
uh, John called and I, you know, I was happy to see his name, but I was like, I wonder why he's calling me on a Saturday morning, you know, 10 days before the election. And uh, I picked up the phone. He's like, I'm so sorry. He said, uh, I just got off the phone with the governor. There's a shooting in progress at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, right across the street from where my kids go to school. Um, we don't know how bad it is, but it's bad. And uh, Giselle and I are, we're stopping the campaign. I spoke to the governor. We're, we're not campaigning until further notice. Giselle and I are driving home to Pittsburgh to be with our community. Um, you guys do whatever you need to do. I just wanted to let you know. And um, it, uh, yeah, go ahead, John, sorry. Yeah, no, but it, it was, I, I was at the Wells Fargo Center meeting union members. I, I'll never forget it. And I heard about it before it really made the news. And and I, it, it was, what well, was obvious, it was, a, it was a crazed gunman and it was at a synagogue. And all but certain at that point, it was targeting specifically uh, the Jewish community. And all I could think of was, is like, I need to call Jeff because like here and I, here, here he and I are like, you know, like going at it and running uh, an election. And all I could want to say is, is like, we've got a maniac targeting people of your faith, just, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be a part of this right now. Like, and, and I, I was like, I'm off the trail. Like, this is crazy. And I, actually Jeff was the first person I called like honestly he was the first person I called and I was like I you know I don't care what anyone else says you know we're off the trail and we are heading back to Pittsburgh we immediately left uh and made a candlelight vigil uh in Squirrel Hill where the the tree of life is that evening because it's like this has nothing to do with politics and everything to do with basic humanity and I to to, 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 to ha if I had someone targeting you know, people of, of, you know, like, I, I just, I just had to let Jeff know that, that it, it, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it was really something. I mean, I, I spent the rest of the day watching CNN and, and periodically I spoke to the attorney general, uh, who is Jewish and an elected official. And I just wanted to see if Josh and his family were okay and make sure they weren't in any danger. I spoke to some leaders in our Jewish community, the Jewish Federation and Jewish community here in Philadelphia. And around four o'clock that day, uh, I called John and I said, you may not know what this means. I said, but you're a mensch. And uh, he chuckled and, uh, and I said, thank you for calling. And he said, brother, you were the first person I thought of. I had to, I had to speak with you. And that, I think, you know, that if, if I looked at a point on a time, Larry, where, uh, you know, it, it became, you know, I said, this is a man I want to work with. How do we, how do we do stuff together? Because that, that, to be able to stop in the middle of everything that's going on and think about a friend, a new friend, but a friend who's Jewish and who is obviously watching this terrible tragedy in his hometown. Uh, I mean, John's watching it in his hometown. Uh, I, it was very meaningful. It remains meaningful. It's something I, uh, I come back to when I get frustrated with how uh, silly the world seems sometimes. I, I think about that call and uh, about that bond. John, did, did you know what the word mensch meant? Uh, I, I wasn't sure, and uh, but uh, but at the at the same time, like I just I I was just I was devastated because like for somebody to just go in and systematically execute people practicing their faith in their place of worship is it's devastating, and you know I I, I would only learn the, the you know like just uh, like I was honored to 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 go and visit you know shortly after and. You know the the bullet holes were in the plaster and you know and just it's it's just devastating it's 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 a pathology in america and it's horrible and like uh, the you know and i i, I knew knew uh, jeff and his family and and he take multiple trips to israel and he just how how involved he is in that and and it's just like this is it's revolting at every level and this it transcends politics. It's 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 gut check basic humanity. And um, and I'm not going to be in an adversarial role with this going forward. It, it's just like this is just awful. Uh, I, I should tell the audience if you have questions to put them in the Q and A uh, uh, rubric at the bottom of the screen and. If you don't want to join us on screen, indicate that. Otherwise, Shadman, our uh, uh, tech guru, our, our Oz uh, 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 guy uh, behind the scenes here, will uh, invite you 
to join us on screen so we have a real town hall uh, type of feel. Uh, uh, it's always great when citizens come on and have, have discussion. Um, there was another Mensch uh, moment. This was after the election uh, and uh, at Pennsylvania Society. Uh, tell me about, you two guys took the stage at one point together. How did that come to be? Because that's very, it's, it's very rare that after an election, the candidates appear together. So I got a call, and I have to admit, I, I have always wanted to speak at the PMA uh, breakfast and seminar, this luncheon seminar. And Mr. Anton, John has a great story about Mr. Anton and what a, what a mensch. Anton. And um, so I've always wanted to speak there. And uh, I was hoping, you know, maybe during the campaign, at some point I get invited, maybe after the campaign. And so right before Thanksgiving, I get a call from David Taylor, who's the president of the PMA, and said, I need a favor. I said, oh, my gosh, my heart's racing. Oh my, I'm going to get invited to speak. He said, uh, we really want to invite the lieutenant governor-elect to speak. And I said, huh? And they said, well, we understand you have a, you guys are friends. I was like, uh-huh. Um, do you mind asking him if he would be interested in speaking? And then if so, could you connect us? And I, I had that feeling, which I hadn't probably had since third grade, where I had a crush on a girl and she asked me if my friend liked her and if I could, that was exactly the feeling I had. It brought back all those memories from Mrs. Voigt's third grade class came rushing back like a Marcel Proust novel here. And I, I calmed down and I said, okay, yes, I, I could do that. And I called John and, and I said, uh, they'd like to invite you to speak. Uh, and uh, John said, nah, you know, Giselle and I are gonna be in New York. It's been a long campaign. And then he said, you know what though I would do if, if you'd appear with me, um, that would be really meaningful. And I'd love to tell the story about you know, how we created uh, a place to have civil discourse and to become friends and to work on issues together during this campaign. And I called David Taylor back and he, he just loved it. He said, this is what Mr. Anton was all about. That's what this event is about. And we would love to have you both do it. And um, so John, it was really John's stage and he, he shared it. I, I, I had no interest in doing it unless Jeff, well, it was two tiered. It was one, if Jeff, if Jeff was interested and if the PA society would go for it. Otherwise, I said, otherwise, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm all set. Thanks. And, and as Jeff said, they embraced it. And, and that's what it was because I wouldn't want to do any, do it any other way because, um, and I've said this to Jeff then, and I've said it since on a couple of times, like I'm legitimately sad that, that we don't have Jeff in service to the Commonwealth, you know, uh, right now. And, and, um, and that's the, the nature of elections, that there has to be one, a winner and someone that didn't. And, and, and Pennsylvania, you know, Jeff makes Pennsylvania better, as you mentioned, with this 30 day fund and whatever. But, but in terms of public service, you know, we, 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 we'd be a better Commonwealth with Jeff in public service. Um, but that, that being said, having, um, having that forum to just talk about that in a room that's, you know, filled with political operatives and people of, of that, you know, background, you know, maybe it was viewed as cynical or like whatever, but I'm like, I don't care. It's, it's the truth because it's gone too far. So. Senator King, when we stepped off the dais, um, and the, I think the crowd, I mean, John and I really, we had fun. We, we had them laughing for a good 20, 25 minutes. And, uh, and it wasn't rehearsed. It was really just, sort of off the cuff, we'll see what we do. Um, but when I stepped off the day, a Senator Casey came over to me and put both his hands on, a on my shoulders and said, he kind of leaned in and just said, thank you for doing that. It's really, we need more of that. And um, I mean, Senator Casey's been around politics a little bit, all right, you know, since, since he was a young man. And uh, that was, that meant a lot for him to say that. Well, and, and from what- Wait, Funny story though, that yeah. I, you know, I, I wear a black shirt like I'm wearing now and, and jeans and I actually wasn't allowed in the cl club. But so I, they said, sir, you're not allowed. I'm like, but I'm, I'm speaking. And they said, well, OK, but you have to basically just sit on this one couch in this one area and then that's it. And then, you, you know, whatever. And I was like, hey, fine. That, that's what it is. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I like 
<laughs> I was I was the the elect de, lieutenant governor elect of Pennsylvania at that time, and they literally wouldn't basically let me get off that couch because of my uh, my attire. So yeah, and so I sat with John, and then we went up to the stage together. And when I think David Taylor said, "Well, how did you guys become friends?" And I said, "Well, it's obvious. I had my suit. You know, I had a blue suit, blue shirt, red tie." I look right out of the like Ronald Reagan central casting there, except for his hair is much better than mine. And I, uh, I, I remember leading into my microphone and saying, well, basically we're, the, we're like twins. And John <laughs> leans in with perfect comedic timing and goes, yeah, separated at birth. Yeah. And the place just, and from there we were off to the races. It was, uh, it was a really, really fun 20, 25 minutes we had there. That's great. That's great. And I know, I do know that John, from talking to you in, uh, March about this. You really want to talk about this. You really want to model this type of bipartisanship in in politics. This is intentional on your part, right? Well, it's not intentional in the sense that it's part of an agenda. Like my friendship with Jeff is sincere and and yeah. it's like a, a lifelong. But but in terms of like talking about it, we we have to. Like my goodness, like things are so bitter and so divided and and it's like uh, we we just are, are headed off the rails in the wrong direction on this stuff and it tears families apart it's tearing our country apart and it, it's it's just this idea that you know you you you're x so you're bad and you're y and you're you're bad and it's just not true it's just not true and um and and I would say to, to, to Jeff, it, it's like, it, it doesn't need to be that way, but I understand how it, it often is. But at the end of the day, I'm not gonna, you know, like, uh, I, I don't care who knows it. I don't care whatever. It's, it's like, um, I, I'm proud to call Jeff a friend and, and I don't care. I don't think it of course ever would, but I don't care if it would cost me votes or cost me respect or anything. If somebody would, not vote for me or have res less respect for me as a Democrat, then I I'm not interested in their support because this is what we need uh, more of, quite frankly, so. John, how have you, in your, in your first uh, statewide position, have you found this level of collegiality, uh, especially across the aisle, in any, in any sense? I haven't observed much of it, quite frankly. And I mean, and, you know, right now it's it's like everything's hyper, everything. I mean, it's it's just you know, and the and the pandemic's only amplified what was already there, uh, beforehand. But uh, it, it's it's one of those things that uh, I it has to snap back. It just has to, and I believe it will because I think inherently people would rather have less brutality and coarseness and they would want more collaboration and more hey like what what let's, what can we actually get done here so you know i think larry i mean the takeaway i have we took a chance right i mean john could have told me to get bent when i went over and and, and said hello but he he took a chance and was uh he 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 gave that kindness and friendliness right back and we exchange numbers and I, I think there is an old adage about it's hard to hate someone when you know the names of their children um it's hard to hate someone when you've broken bread and i do think i mean cheryl and i are not perfect about this but you know having people over to the home our home for shabbat dinner uh who don't always share the same views and how and who might strongly disagree about things but who are who like commit ahead of time to make sure they don't lose their cool and and start throwing wine glasses um that is at a very micro level a way to to start to bridge these gaps at, at a i'm saying at a street level right at a community level um and a political level i mean john and i've talked about this a lot like the primary system drives people to the to the poll uh, drives people to the uh, extremes and um you just i i think i got a lot of grief in my campaign uh, in the primary for donations we've made to Democrats over the years. I mean, a lot of grief. And I just said, that's, I support friends. Cheryl supports whoever she wants to support. I don't certainly don't tell my wife how to donate or who to donate to. And, you know, if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but that's just the way I live my life. And I, I know that John and Giselle 
Uh, I mean, having spent a lot of time with them, they're, they're the same way. And I do, I mean, John certainly has a more insight into this, having spent a lot more time in Harrisburg. But um, the one thing I, I watched John's campaign and thought, wow, that's really, he's doing the same thing. He got out to the communities and the neighborhoods and the rural areas of Pennsylvania. They're not typically Democratic votes. And he worked to understand those voters. And so we had a lot to talk about because I was naturally spending a lot of time in those places. And I thought that was, again, my big takeaway from the campaign was that we were saying the same issues, whether it was mental health challenges, whether it was the opioid addiction, whether it was rural broadband, whether it was people above I-80 feeling like they're left out and not cared about in Harrisburg, like all of these issues, I was hearing the same stuff. And so we really could start to riff on policy ideas that would address some of these things that are not Democratic or Republican. They're just practical. And I know that sounds pie in the sky. I know that sounds Pollyannish, but, um, but it's absolutely, I think, how you start. Well, I, I don't want to uh, underestimate the risk that you guys took, because in the current political milieu, because of gerrymandering, because of the, the uh, media universe, the more politicians are afraid of, of being primary than anything else. And so, and both of you, I mean, Jeff, you're a dying breed. You're a Jack Kemp Republican or an Arlen Specter Republican. Uh, and John, you've taken stands that the left has gone bonkers over, like with fracking over uh, jobs. Uh, uh, and I, I, do you guys realize <laughs> the risk that you uh, have, have taken in your, in your political careers along these lines? All right. I think I think standing up. I think voters in, intrinsically respect people that stand up for what they believe in. You know, and you know, I I joke about I joke about Sheets and Wawa, for example. And I think people appreciate. I'm like, hey, I'm Team Sheets. Instead of saying, oh, I love them both equally, and and you know, like I joke when you know, like you know, the Steelers and the Eagles. It's like I'm rooting for the Pennsylvania team. You know, and it, it's just like it, it, everything's a dodge and. And you're, you're not going to agree on every single issue unless your name is the one on the ballot. Uh, uh, so uh, I think it's important to just be true to who you are. And like I said, I, I don't think my friendship with Jeff would ever cost me a vote. And, and if it did, it's like, well, that's OK, because because I, I would have no qualms with Jeff being in a leadership position because I know he's he's a compassionate individual with, with character and that that whatever policy it is like it's it's always going to be coming from a from a good place and and uh, like I think he is like a, a model of what what the Republican Party you know should be if, if you want because um, you know it, it just like that's why we have two different parties in politics is that the you know, neither neither idea or neither side has a, a, a monopoly on good ideas or a different way of thinking things. And and for Jeff to be civically engaged the way he was helping companies uh, during this pandemic, I mean, like that speaks volumes right there. I mean, that is just tremendous. I mean, like tremendous. Like here I am, a, the, the Democratic Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, saluting my friend and and Republican. You know, saying that he is doing critical work in helping Pennsylvania through this pandemic. And, and meanwhile, we just couldn't be more divided and we just need more of that. You know, well, and I want to get to the 30 day fund in a minute, but I, I do want to share with you guys a piece I, I wrote seven or eight years ago uh, uh, about this group of congressmen, 12 of them, uh, Peter Welch, the Democrat, and guy named Joe Barton from Texas. They didn't agree on anything, but they put together a group, uh, six D's, six R's, and had Costco lasagna dinners every week. Uh, and, and they said, I remember them telling me that, yes, um, gerrymandering, uh, primary, you know, the Tea Party, the, the left, all problems. But the real problem is, we as politicians don't hang out together anymore. Uh, 
is it as I, I, I share your concern that we're all being Pollyannish. May, may, might it be as simple as that, that, that politics is used to be about relationships and uh, it's now about ideology? Um, I think, I mean, so from where I said, first of all, so for the record, I'm an Eagles and Sheets guy. So like, in case there was I, any I, I think you're, you're pandering, you're trying to, yeah, that, that's like a, a cross-state <laughs> pander. Oh, only, oh, only good. I happen to, the Sheets family from Blair County are amazing. And uh, I love texting them when I travel to other places, be like, there's another Sheets, Virginia, West Virginia. Um, yeah, I do think it starts with that. I mean, Giselle, um, like I'm comfortable calling or texting Giselle about any issue, um, you know, policy issue or just like, hey, what's going on? Um, Cheryl, John, Giselle, and I have a and, uh, also below deck. I mean, that that's what we also text about is our <laughs> our shared uh, shameful uh, uh, guilty pleasure of watching below deck on Bravo. You know, that is true. And below deck I mad. Know, I don't even know what below, below deck is. <laughs> it's not a. Best that you don't actually, but. Uh, but yeah, this is Jeff airing our dirty laundry and, and each, each other's op opposition research uh, right now. So. There, 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 may, there may be a text chain between the four of us commenting on these Bravo shows, but that's, you know, that's conjecture. Uh, there's... <laughs> you cannot there may, confirm nor deny. No, no, no. There's no, uh, there's no, there's no official records act. Uh, the... Uh, but I do think, Larry, I do think it is that simple. I really do. Um, like I get back to the Shabbat dinner part of like, if, 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 we thought, if we thoughtfully invite people to our home, anybody, it's not just me and Cheryl, any of us, uh, you know, and ask people to come around the table and to talk uh, in a civil way, I think it starts, it can start with eight people and then those eight people go and do it. And, and I know, again, that sounds so simple and obvious, but it's really, and I understand we're in a pandemic. I'm not ignoring that, but I'm saying in a non-pandemic world, I do think it starts with that. I mean, it, it, if we're waiting for the elected leaders at our city, state, federal level to just start doing it, uh, we're missing an opportunity. I think they do need to do it, or we think, you know, I mean, I know we in our family feel that strongly. I know John and Giselle feel that way, um, but it is, it is citizens can do that at, at the most basic level on a Friday night or a Saturday night or a Tuesday night. Uh, I'm, I'm getting texts that we're having a, a, a technical difficulty about calling people up to the, uh, the screen. Um, so I will start reading some, some questions to you, to you guys. Uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, writes, I love to hear this kind of mutually respectful conversation, but it feels like these two politicians are unicorns. Since the Republican Party got infected by the Tea Party virus, it seems very unlikely that the, the divide can be bridged. Is this too negative an observation? Please persuade us this kind of collegial goodwill can play out in Washington. Oh, are we supposed to solve that? <laughs> <laughs> um, John, you want me to go first? Yeah, go, please, absolutely. Um, so I, Towards the end of the campaign, and the Philadelphia, Chris Brennan at the Philadelphia Inquirer really captured both John's campaign and my campaign a week apart on the front page of the Inquirer, two Mondays or Monday apart in uh, mid October. And John and I were going both, as I said, to rural places. And towards the end of the campaign, I, my, my closing remarks in my stump speech uh, got to be something along the lines of turn off your television and go talk to your neighbor. Um, and I know I keep coming back to that theme, but I do. I do think it starts with that. And I do think when you travel, and look, John and I had the enormous privilege to travel this huge state for two years, uh, two years, and visit all 67 counties multiple times. And when you get out into the real world, you know, not CNN or Fox or MSNBC, into the real world, uh, people are not that divided. Um, there's disagreements, and people feel very strongly about issues. I'm not, I'm not foolish enough to think that everything's copacetic, but I think generally speaking, people are not nearly as divided as it appears on television. And I'm saying that with full understanding that we are at a moment in our nation's history that feels like it's worse than it's ever been. Uh, I get that. I'm not, I'm not blind to that. But, um, but again, I, I know if I went and visited uh, Altoona right now or Hollidaysburg right now or Warren right now, 
I would see the same smiling, decent people. Uh, and when I go into West Philadelphia, uh, or I go into uh, East Mount Airy or Germantown, uh, again, very like friendly, welcoming people. So there's there's a lot of good in the midst of all this mess. Are, uh, John, do you agree that what I'm hearing is that the Commonwealth and the country for that matter might not be as divided as the media narrative would have us believe. Yeah, I, I would sub, I would subscribe to that. I, I, I would, and and uh, of course there are unreachables on both sides of the uh, the equation, and that's not like a false equivalence argument or whatever. It's just a fact. There are plenty of people on both sides that you know the only good D is a whatever, and the only good R is a whatever, and and it's just like and that the twain shall never meet, but. I think, I think a majority of people want civility. A majority of people want to transcend this idea that, that this, this person is my enemy based on, you know, like we're, we're all Americans and we're all Pennsylvanians. And we all grew up with some of the same experiences. We watched the same shows. We, you know, uh, I mean, uh, 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 we all played Pac-Man growing up at Donkey Kong and we all, I mean, we all have these 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 commonalities in, in our collective growing up in Pennsylvania, at least of people of my age, and and it's just like we we need to stop focusing on like these hair trigger extreme kind of you know like what activates that part of the brain that makes it more you know like addictive or I gotta you know get on as opposed to just saying, hey, like, what's, what's the right thing or what's the best thing in, in this particular case? And it's getting more and more difficult. Sides are getting more and more polarized. And, and it, we shouldn't lose fact uh, or sight of the fact that social media is a sewer for the most part, not all, but most of it. Um, and, and certainly, like, the political discourse on social media is beyond. Um, and the other is that, you know, and we're not going we're not gonna solve this tonight, but there's a lot of people who make a lot of money uh, creating and fomenting divide. Um, and so that's something that we, uh, we need to look at, but again, it, we're not going to solve that tonight either. Uh, but it is, it's worth, it's worth mentioning that. I would never say anything to someone on social media that I wouldn't say to their face. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just that's and, and, and this idea that, that, I mean, pe people, it, it just, it doesn't have to be that, that, that terrible. And um, you can feel strongly about an issue. You can agree to disagree. And you can just kind of strap it up in, in the sense of, of, you know, what happens in between the, the whistles is, is, is the game. But it doesn't have to extend outside the whistles. It, you can still be friends. You can still have a beer. And you can still work to a better outcome for everybody. Um, and, and I, I would never want to lose, lose sight of that. Well, and, and it's not, it, it, it is being civil and being friends across the aisle, but it, it, it's also the art of finding common ground a, across the aisle, right? Um, which, which, uh, it, it, it happens way too, I mean, uh, Joe Biden is, uh, campaigning on the Affordable Care Act. He was able to get three votes from in the Republican Senate, and that that was a that was a uh, triumph. Uh, the days of, you know, I, when I was growing up, there was not a lot of daylight between Henry Scoop Jackson and Warren Rudman in the Senate. And uh, how do we get, even if we get civility, how do we get to common ground politically? That's the $64,000 question, especially right now with, with, with so much gnashing and churn online. And I mean, I don't think anybody really knows because social media is unprecedented in human political theory and history. So it would be naive to think that that's not having a fundamental impact on altering the basic genome of American politics. It, it, it just, it is. And you have videos, you can have deep fake, you can have misinformation spread at the velocity of light online. And before you know it, it somehow becomes part of the narrative before there's anyone even stops and says, is this really accurate? 
is this really true? And, and that, that kind of shared experience and shared things that we do not question, we do not attack, we do not undermine. I mean, those ta a lot of those taboos have been broken, quite frankly. And I think that's, that's the real tragedy because all of those things underpin American democracy, whichever party happens to be in power at the time. We, we are back up and running. Let's, let's uh, welcome a fellow citizen, Steve, Steve Irwin. Hi, Steve. Can you hear us? He's on mute from what I can tell. Steve, are you on mute? Can you unmute yourself? Steve, I, I, it looks, appears he's not only on mute and his screen is freezed. Frozen. Oh, so maybe we're not back. <laughs> um, <laughs> While we're trying to get that worked out, let me ask up oh. here. Was that you, Steve? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's not happening. Uh, while we try and get that worked out, let me let me uh, we, we mentioned uh, I wanted to ask you guys each about uh, a pet your pet projects right now. Uh, Jeff, we mentioned the 30-day fund a couple times. For those who don't know what it is, can you give us a, a, a thumbnail? And I find it really inspiring. Sure. About in mid-April, in the midst of this initial shutdown, which has affected everybody, right? Uh, you know, everyone in the Commonwealth, everyone in the country, pretty much the whole world, um, I decided uh, to start a, a nonprofit that was dedicated to a very simple mission of helping small businesses survive a uh, 30 to 45 day period by getting them quickly $3,000, a forgivable loan of $3,000. And so talk to a neighbor who's a professor at Penn. Uh, that started with three students. And then uh, we got to 50 uh, Penn students who are really the front end powering uh, the organization and built out this amazing board with Jeff Brown and Richard Phillips, who are both good friends of yours, Roger Braunfeld and Maya Camo and Alicia Schoonmaker and Mr. Ner Tom Nerney and this whole great Tony Payton, uh, Mustafa Rashid, like we have this great board of remarkable people. Oh, by the way, just for the record, seven Democrats and two Republicans, I think, on the board. Maybe I think we might be eight Democrats and two Republicans at this point. That's, so, a, that's in keeping with Philadelphia registration. <laughs> <laughs> Although this is the whole state. Um, that's true. That's true. But, uh, but very thoughtfully curated on, on my part to, to make sure that we did not appear at all political and um, and wanted to just really be mission focused and with uh, great leadership by the whole group uh, remarkable um, uh, civic minded passion and focus and energy from Ira Lupert and Pam Eastat um, and with a million dollar challenge grant that they give us we've raised 2.4 million dollars as we sit here today I mean like, uh, think about that two point that's that's extraordinary Jeff I had no idea that it was that much and, and Jeff, it's a model for what you can do to help. I mean, that's extraordinary. And, and that, again, it, and that should be scaled and modeled all across the country. I mean, absolutely, you know. Thank you. I mean, it's been, um, it's been a labor of love for everybody involved. We've, we've helped, uh, as of today, about 570 businesses. We have money in the bank. We're uh, asking small businesses in Pennsylvania. They're still struggling to please apply at uh, pa30dayfund.com. And uh, people ask us, like, when are you shutting the fund down? And the answer is, when the need goes away. I think at this point, the board has uh, committed to, to sticking with it um, until the, the applications stop. And we're just gonna, we're gonna keep helping people until people stop asking. And, and, and it's filling a need because a, a lot of these businesses were not eligible for PPP. They either, uh, didn't have checking accounts, or they're returning citizens, which automatically uh, 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 takes them out of being eligible for PPP. So you're, you're doing a, a, a tremendous service in actual, in neighborhoods. It's genius, yeah. you know, because, you know, let me, let me talk Jeff up, because he's too humble to do that. It's genius, because it helps the most vulnerable businesses that have been, you know, at, at, at greatest risk during this pandemic. It doesn't have a lot of bureaucratic red tape and all that other stuff. And the velocity of which the funds reach it is what's needed now. And I, 
I know these some of these businesses, and it means everything. It can it brings tears to people. You know that. Wait a minute. Somebody just gave my business three thousand dollars with no strings attached. Isn't jamming a camera in my face trying to, you know, like make it about something other than that? It's just because he helps. I mean, that's extraordinary, and that's the kind of solution. It's like Democrats that we always get banged for thinking that government is a solution for everything. It's like, well, it's not the solution. It's innovative private sector thinking like what Jeff did all entirely on his own, I might add, to, to get this up and running because sometimes you can't afford the bureaucracy or sometimes you need to be nimble and you need to be sniper specific to help these kind of businesses because they either lack the ability or the sophistication or, or the expertise to file an application or get in line. They don't have lobbyists. They just need resources, and that's what Jeff did, and it's it's genius. I appreciate that. I mean, it's uh, we have a great board, and a lot of a lot of credit to the whole board and Jeff Brown in particular, who you know, was speaking to Ira Looper shortly after. Um, I mean, we'll never forget that any of us, uh, you know, shortly after George Floyd, George Floyd's murder and the uh, this the protests, which unfortunately turned into some rioting and looting that last weekend of May, first weekend of June in Philadelphia, uh, a lot of small minority owned and women owned businesses got wrecked in that weekend. Uh, and uh, Jeff and Ira were speaking and Jeff told Ira uh, and Pam about what we were doing. And then came the million dollar challenge grant, which really changed the whole, the whole trajectory of the organization. And so it's really, it was a whole team approach. Um, and John and I talked a lot before it got formed, while it was being formed, um, you know, I, I reached out to him just to, to get some advice on areas of the state and other other aspects. So it's really, you know, it's not just what you're seeing here tonight and the campaign. We've uh, we've kept up that uh, confidential sort of check in. What do you think? Uh, telephone calls, you know, right up through today. Uh, let's 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 ask. Uh, let's see if we can get another citizen up here. Anne, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, hi, Anne. How you doing? What's on your mind? Hi, Anne. <laughs> I want to know when they're going to get to the nitty gritty. I understood the first five minutes that there, there's a bromance, there's all this going on, and I love it. I've been involved in politics, national politics. Uh, unfortunately, my, my uh, late husband, Miles Tannenbaum, passed away. And, um, you know, I, um, so I, I lost um, uh, my ability to really be um, more of a, um, a presence, but I just want to know what were the things that you agreed on? What were the things that you were, and also, you know, John Fetterman, he could be a member of our tribe. I love his last name, you know, <laughs> I mean, come on. And, uh, and uh, I, I just, I just love this whole, it's really wonderful that what you're doing. And uh, so tell me what, what you've um, had to compromise on and what things you didn't really agree on, but you negotiated to to uh, in a way that the other person understood better what you were where you were coming from. I, I, I never had any litmus test, you know, discussions with Jeff. I mean, we never had that. I, I would just like um, it, it's it, it's just uh, I can always count on Jeff to have a thoughtful, intelligent, and well reason position on anything whether i agree with it or not i know that's it's great a sincere place and that's and that that's what really matters at least in, in in my book and here's another secret in politics there's a lot more agreement you know between the parties but it's not something that they talk about publicly because we're in such a polarized place there where um, virtually everything becomes heretical if if it clashes with with you know certain facets of 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 where the party's at, I think Jeff can speak to that too. I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And and it's good to see you. And I knew Miles, um, and I remember when he passed. And we did some work together in the Republican Jewish Coalition. And um, yeah, it's good to see you. Um, Thank you. So yeah, I, I mean, I in thinking about this, the in terms of like how you interact and and discuss issues. I think I always started with, and look, sometimes people disappoint you and, and you, you go back on that. But from my perspective, I never once doubted, starting from the, you know, when I won the primary all the way through the general and to today, 
that I wasn't running against Tom Wolf and John Fetterman because they were awful, terrible, you know, mean, nasty people who didn't love Pence. Like quite the opposite. I mean, I know them both to be very decent, thoughtful, kind people who love Pennsylvania every bit as much as I do. Um, you know, we we may disagree on on uh, on. Um, I'm trying to think. Like on our debate, we talked about guns. We talked about marijuana. We talked about. Uh, education. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of issues in that debate, but never once when I was answering my question, I know John too, we never once thought like the other guy's evil and he doesn't love Pennsylvania and he doesn't want to solve these problems. Quite the opposite. Um, and I think if you, great. if you start with the premise, now again, I want to stress, people do disappoint you and people lie and they do things they shouldn't do. And like, once they do that, you adjust, you don't, you don't confide in them. You don't trust, trust their word the next time. But for us, you know, I never, in my concession speech that night uh, on election night in 2018, uh, I remember saying, you know, the, I congratulated John on becoming the next lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth that we both love. And I, I don't think I ever deviated from that during the campaign. I mean, I mean, I definitely had some bad days, but it was never directed at my opponents. I, I remember that night. And of course, uh, like I, rem I was, I was sad that, that, that Jeff wasn't, yeah, like uh, just because I, uh, again, it, it, it's it's um, Pennsylvania would be b better with him in her service. You know, I, I really believe that, and, and I've said this to Jeff offline numerous times. Like I, I hope I hope there's there's the next chapter, and and uh, in public life. But if there isn't, he's already demonstrated. You know, the kind of impact that he's having. Uh, you know, helping small businesses across Pennsylvania. And um, I, yeah, I, I just can't imagine a, a better example and, and a, like a, a North Star for a party that I think needs some recalibration on some of its issues and principles, quite frankly. That's great. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ann, thank you so much. Are, can I ask you, Ann, uh, uh, didn't you have some, and your family have something to do with the Milan salad dressing? Yes, that's, uh, that's what I run the Milan, that's how I know Jeff Brown. Um, I, I am a um, vendor for Jeff Brown and uh, thanks to you, I learned, Larry, I learned about the PA30 fund and immediately made a contribution because you know, that's, that's, that's what we have to do, help everybody and and I'm on the board of the Presbyterian Medical Center and, and a board at HUP and our focus is the underserved and I love to do that in all areas. Uh, well, that's great, that's great. Thank, thank you, you're, you're, thank you're, you so you're, much. You're a terrific citizen, so thank you. Thank uh, you. We, we don't have a lot of time left and there are a couple of great questions here um, that I, I do wanna get to. Um, Greg Riccardi uh, asks, a new push for pushing legislation forward for adult use of cannabis in PA has begun again with a new approach to offsetting the financial impact on the state from COVID. Is it possible that the spirit of the relationship with Bartos and Fetterman can influence lawmakers in Harrisburg to rise above the partisanship? Can this be the model for, for something uh, and an issue that, John, that you've really pushed for? I don't know, but, but what I can say is, is that it, it comes from a true bipartisan place in, in my heart. Like, like I, I get to say this in a public forum. I don't consume marijuana. I, it's not part of my life. I, I don't often consume alcohol and I definitely don't consume tobacco. But I, I agree that all adults should have safe legal access to, to uh, this, uh, these substances and, you know, and to partake. And I don't think we've ever been in a place, I know we've never been in a place as a state where we've needed these kind of resources more. And you think of what Jeff's doing on his level, well, what if you could debt direct hundreds of millions of dollars every year to do just that? And have that be free money, essentially, because there's already a thriving cannabis market in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, it's the black market and it's only lining the cartel's pockets and it's criminalizing tens of thousands of our citizens every every year. I genuinely don't understand why, why marijuana is not, well, it is bipartisan. It's just there are leaders in Harrisburg that 
refuse to bring it up. And, and what I would like to just say is, is that it's bipartisan. It is going to involve their input and in where the money goes. It's going to involve their input on how we as a state regulate it. But Jeff, you guys will feel it a lot more than we will. You're going to be 15 minutes from legal marijuana, but it's going to be New Jersey's legal marijuana in a few months. Why wouldn't we want it to be our legal marijuana? You know, we, you know, our farmers, our uh, treasury, our job, I mean, like, my God, it's, it's a no-brainer. And I just wish we could stop, I mean, you know, the, the partisanship and just say, the time is now. This is a bipartisan issue. And even though it's coming out of the mouth of a Democrat, it's, it's a bipartisan solution. It's not a panacea, it's not the end all, but it is, name one kind of turnkey solution that it's just a matter of changing the law and we're good to go with hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of thousands of new jobs and, and freedom for everybody that in, from being a criminal for using a plan. And I, I saw firsthand on the campaign trail and, and through to today what the medical marijuana industry is doing to help people and how people are genuinely getting help in a way that is not nearly as addictive or not addictive compared to opioids and other things. And so there's no question that the medical marijuana, and it's a success. I mean, the system works in, in the state. It's, it's this, you know, I think, John, do I have my stats right? That more, more marijuana has been consumed in Pennsylvania through medical in the last six months than in the previous two years, um, because- I'm not sure, but we, we, it, we have over 125,000 people now and growing. And think about the impact that's having. And my wife is, is, a, is a card carrying user of cannabis. It's, it's helped change her life. And now when I went across all 67 counties, people love it, they love it. Even, you know, remember how contentious and scary it was at one point in time? And now it's like, oh yeah, that was actually no big deal. And I know it'll be the same with legal marijuana. And, and you know, I just wish I could sit down with these leaders and say, it's a bipartisan issue. This isn't about, you know, we're right, you're wrong. It's about saying, can't Pennsylvania move beyond these artificial divides and do what's right for, for all of us? And I will say, just in closing on that, Larry, that it, I think it's outstanding that the governor and John and their administration are starting to look at how to help small businesses, and in particular, minority-owned uh, small businesses that have been left out, and communities of color that have borne the brunt of, uh, of the criminal justice system as it relates to something that's very likely to be uh, not only decriminalized, but legalized. And I think that's, there's a lot of thought that's gone into that proposal, and I, and I applaud them for that. Well, I applaud you guys uh, because I think you've modeled for us uh, a civility and affection that <clears throat> that I wish invaded all of our politics. You turn on the news and it's hard to not be depressed. Uh, it's one of the reasons we started The Citizen was to be focused on solutions. And in cities in particular, you know, there's that old saying that that there's no liberal or conservative way to fill a pothole that it's that level of practicality that you both have have brought to you to not only to your campaign but to all of your projects so i can't thank you enough for spending this this time with us and, and by the way the 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 offer is open uh if the bromance continues and jeff you uh and 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 the lieutenant governor go out one night and have a have a few beers and you end up getting a tattoo, we will cover it live. Well, let me just, I, gotta say, I gotta say this before our time together ends. I would be proud to stand on any stage, any venue, any, uh, with, with Jeff. Uh, he's, he's just a, a good guy. And, and, you know, Pennsylvania politics needs more of that. And I'm proud to call him my friend. I'm sad that he is not in, in our Commonwealth service in a public manner. And uh, I, I get the, the feeling that we have to snap back and head towards, you know, we need to be more like Jeff Bardos, quite frankly, uh, and less like where we are right now. And uh, I'm grateful for his, his friendship. I'm grateful to you all for putting this venue on. And I get a chance to talk about my, my buddy that 
that I, I think and I know has, has made the dialogue more civil and more thoughtful and more compassionate and more effective, you know, as, as he has with the 30 day fund. So it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we love John and Giselle and uh, it's always good to see them. And I will have, I can't, I can't leave without noting that it's much better to be in person. Uh, it's much more fun to be in person. The only nice thing about Zoom, during the campaign when we were in the same room and people didn't know who we were, I would be referred to as the short one. So, and, I, and so it is nice. The only nice thing about Zoom is uh, that I, I look about the same height as John. Uh, but, uh, and I'm six foot one, by the way, I'm not short. But, uh, but it is, uh, it's great to be with John anywhere and always. And I do sincerely look forward to tackling some policy issues and working on other things here in, in Pennsylvania together. That's great. Uh, to follow up on, on a, a line of a word that was used earlier, I think you're both menches. Uh, so thank you for sharing your uh, uh, mensch kite with us uh, tonight. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see everyone next week with, uh, with Chrissy Houlihan next Wednesday. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for hosting us. Bye-bye. Good night, John.